back up the truck. <laughs> yeah. You know, this I said this brace was only loose in that one little spot, and I thought it was, but once I cleaned all the glue around the edges, this whole end is loose too. Um, this one I still can't find fault with, other than, I'm, well, I mean, I found fault from here to here, but the rest of it seems completely solid, so I don't see any reason to mess with this one. This one here, I'm not so sure about. It's loose here, and it's loose here, so that means only a little bit of this is being held, it looks like. So back up the truck here, let's see if we can take this one out. I think it probably needs to come out. What's happened is it's been re-glued right in this area, I can tell, and uh, that's kind of got it, and it's not glued down tight. Let me uh, talk about the gluing and the clamping one more time here and say it a little differently so that you can understand what my real point is here. You know, I don't, I'm not trying to sound like I know everything because that's not the point here. I, I can tell you for sure that there are some things you can get away with and some things you cannot get away with when it comes to gluing. Many people, th I think, have the mistaken idea that like they'll see a brace that's loose. Maybe it's got a little tiny crack in it. Their, their idea is if they fill that crack with glue, uh, let it dry, then it's glued. Well, sort of, kind of, maybe a little bit, but the truth is that's never a strong bond. Whenever you have a crack there and you've got glue filling the crack, that glue will eventually crack itself. It will crack. It will always give up the ghost eventually. Whereas if you put those two pieces together tightly like that with glue in between them and you clamp it and leave it until that glue really cures, then you've got a strong bond. It's a big difference leaving that little tiny gap, even if it's only the width of a hair, is a huge difference of, of clamping it up tight. So that's what I'm really saying and that's what's happened here. Um, this just didn't get clamped up tight, I can tell based on what I'm seeing. It just didn't bond very well. It, a little bit right in here where it's been re-glued, but, but you know, it's a mess. So we're gonna clean that all up now and clean this all up and we'll put it back together properly. This one brace, as I mentioned, is loose about halfway and the rest of it seems completely fine. Um, you know, I'd probably do more damage actually on this one, taking this one apart, than I would just gluing it here and leaving it. How do I, how do I recognize the difference? It's just a solidness. You know, as I was popping the glue along the edges, this didn't indicate any kind of movement whatsoever. Uh, all the rest of it kind of did. You know, you could kind of just tell by the sound, by the feel, that the rest of it wasn't solid except for like in those little bitty places where I pointed out and I pointed them out before I broke it loose and you could see that that was the solid part. Well, this feels to be solid all the way. So I don't think this is a problem area. But because this is loose here, I'm going to get glue under this area and I'm gonna clamp it with this, not the go bar clamps, because I want this, I, by the way, I've also taken some flat, kind of flat edged, um, scraping tools and scrape this whole area really good to get rid of the glue residue that's under there. So I've already done that. I've also scraped and cleaned this whole top so it's smooth and got rid of all the glue residue. So anyway, I'm, I'm ready to go ahead and glue this one back and I will get glue in here and I'll use a paintbrush or whatever I gotta do to get the glue back under there really good. Now I'm only gonna apply the glue from the one side so that I can see it come through the other side and I know it's penetrated all the way. Where if you if you apply it on both sides you really can't tell if it's penetrated underneath there. See I like to use a brush in a case like this because the brush will the bristles will go right back under there no problem and already you can start to see it squeezing out on the other side there. So I know I'm getting good penetration. The brush really helps you with that. 
and everybody has their own technique. That's just the way I do it. You could do a whole bunch of different ways of accomplish the same thing. Okay, and then if you pump it like that, that will also get the glue back in there really good. Now here I'm going to go ahead and put a little glue right up in this crack because it's a little more difficult to get the glue right up to the point where it's where it is already stuck. But otherwise I think we're fine. I'm going to get something and clean all that up. Some people tell me to let that dry and scrape it off later, but I prefer to wash it off. And if you wash it two or three times, then you don't leave any glue residue. I prefer to do it that way. I know other people prefer to, but since, especially since I made such a mess there, spreaders, spreading that all around, I like to wash it up ahead of time. Now, if I had left just a little glue line, that would be different. The reason I want to do this with clamps versus the go bar system, the go bar thing works great for large areas and things, but when you got a real specific spot that's, that is a problem, these clamps will do a much better job. And I'm putting leather on the underside, on the finished side, as you can see. You can really see it squeezing out there now. While I have the opportunity, I thought I'd go ahead and put a cleat on this repair uh, that the customer had made. It was glued with CA glue, which is suitable and fine, but by putting a, a cleat across this with the tight bond glue, I think that will solve it. In fact, I think I'll put two cleats you know, I think this will make it really strong and don't have to worry about it again. And there's already, this is kind of a cleat in itself, this brace. And then I'll put one, this is about an inch away, and then I'll put another one about another inch away. Okay, we'll just let that all sit in peace and harmony for a couple hours, and then we'll be ready to go on. Well, there's what the uh, Regal inside looks like after I put in that new brace. And this is kind of a standard brace in most guitars, so it's not unusual to have that in there. Of course, it doesn't match color-wise. That helped flatten this area a tiny bit. I ain't gonna lie to you and tell you that it's perfect, because it's not, but I don't think it'll get any worse now, compared to, at least compared to the way it would have had I not put that in there. And also having this brace glued back down, of course, makes a lot of difference too. So, you know, having both of those glued in tight, it really did flatten this area. As a matter of fact, most of that underbow that was right here is pretty much gone. I don't know if you can see it or not, but it's pretty flat now, comparatively. The negative is, uh, and I don't know why, but when I look down the plane of this and look down to the... Uh, peg head uh, down that way. It looks like the neck angle is very high, so it looks like it would probably need a neck reset. I'm going to avoid that if I can. One of the things I want to do is put a uh, bridge plate on this. I may leave that and do that separately with clamps because I want to work on the back braces and, I'm, and I'll use the go bar system for the back braces and I can always put the bridge plate in here with clamps through the sound hole while the other thing is glued up. So I'm going to set this aside for the moment and start working on the back. This was another one of those situations where you got to do what you got to do. I first tried to put this in my little go bar clamp setup and there's just enough radius to this brace here in the back that it just, I couldn't get it to clamp right. I tried to wedge it, I tried every different thing and nothing would work. So I just decided to clamp it individually. These other three braces or so that go up here, I think there's three more, I think they're flat enough and looking down on them, they look really flat. So I don't think there's enough radius in these to care. So I think I can probably use the go bar on these other three. But this here had just enough radius to make it a problem. So I'm just gonna go ahead and clamp this one in, leave it for a few hours, and then maybe get these other ones clamped in yet before I call it a day. 
it's the next day. These two set with clamps all night and those two braces are, are fine. And so I put the next two braces on and I put them in the go bar system because this is pretty flat across right here. I have one more brace to put on, but this is off of the uh, table here. So I'm not gonna put this one on with the go bar until these other two dry. So I'll wait a couple hours here and then put this last one on. Well, another day has passed on this uh, Regal guitar. I feel like all the braces on the top are fine. I feel like all the braces on the back are fine and even the cleat I put in there. I just wanted to point out something here. Whenever you take braces off, you can do as good a job as possible and there will almost always be some minor little airspace under there somewhere. In a shop talk recently, I just mentioned that, you know, you shouldn't ever have any airspace and have glue. Well, the bottom line is, on something like this, it's almost inevitable that it's gonna happen. I glued everything as good as I could, clamped it as good as I could, and to my eye, I didn't see any air gaps. I mean, it looked good, but I thought, you know, just to be on the safe side, I'll take CA glue, the thin stuff, and run it along the seams on all of these and see if it penetrates through. Well, it did in about three places on about three braces. But that's just that added insurance that it'll be glued. You know, don't get me wrong, I don't think these braces would have come loose, period. Even, even in five or 10 or 20 years, I think they'd still be tight. But I just wanted to fill those last little bitty voids. And CA glue is about the only glue that you can trust to do something like that. So that's what I did and uh, I cleaned all that up. It's, uh, you know, it's solid. I'm not at all concerned about it. I just did that as an extra bonus, if you will. And it's just kind of a shop tip there that you should know that if you take braces off, put them back on, I don't care how good a job you do, there's a very good chance there'll still be some kind of uh, area there that's not perfectly tight, especially when you're doing a repair like this. All that to say, I think I'm ready to put the back back on the guitar now. I think it's all ready to go. I just wanted to show you what the problem I'm going to have. You know, it lines up really well. You know, I sawed it off here. In most places, it's just fine. But in a couple of places, like the waist here, the waist is actually narrower than the back is. So I'm gonna have to get my hand through the sound hole, push that waist out as I clamp and glue this all down. Just so I'm not getting ahead of myself, I got to thinking I ought to make sure I've got everything tight too. You know, you don't want to get in any hurry putting this back back on here. So I noticed the binding was a little loose here and I noticed the binding was a little loose here. So I've got those glued up and waiting to uh, dry. Here I've got some uh, kerf that's loose. So I want to get that fixed. I'm gonna inspect it for anything else loose. Up, oh, there's another little piece right back here that's loose. Most of the time on a thing like this, I'll take the paintbrush and work it down in there where I can't squeeze the glue down in there. And then like I always say, pump these things a few times. That pumps the glue around. These are some more really good clamps from Harbor Freight. Very inexpensive and yet very strong. And they have rubber on them too, which is nice. I've got to do a, br a big bridge plate here yet too. See, I could have gotten ahead of myself. So I've got to put this big bridge plate on here yet. I'm gonna make that next and we'll get that in here. As you saw there, I uh, you know, had forgotten to put in this uh, bridge plate until just now and you know people might think well you're you know pretty disjointed or you're not thinking these things through or you're not very organized but you got to realize it doesn't to me on my side of it it's completely different than on your side you're you're watching these videos in order and it's one continuous flow here it's not like that at all. I work on something and I might work on two or three other projects like for instance since the last clip you saw I worked on editing a video right over there and <laughs> so you know it's just there's something in between every step. Some people say well you should have a checklist. Well 
try to make a checklist for every scenario there is in the whole world. It's impossible. You just can't do it. The way I combat that problem is that before I do something that's permanent, I stop and I look at everything and I think about it and I tap on everything and I listen. And that's the only way you can really, uh, you know, survive in this type of environment. It may look disjointed to you and it may come across that way, but it's been working for me for around 40 some, or about 40 years now, close to it anyway. Occasionally I make a mistake, but I typically know how to fix it if I make a mistake, so I'm not too worried about it. I'm going to replace this basically with the same kind of thing, except that this was spruce, which is not a bad choice, but I'm going to use Paduke. It's quarter sawn Paduke. I made it slightly bigger all the way around just you know slightly and then I beveled where where that uh, extra you know surround is I just beveled that off to make it look more finished this looks kind of plain and clunky if you ask me but this is all beveled and it looks nice I also left it just a tiny bit thicker and when I say tiny bit I'm talking like eight thousandths thicker but eight thousandths spread out over a whole large area like that is a significant amount I've made some plywood calls that I can lay on top of here and, and clamp it. That'll just help stiffen everything up and keep everything flat. I could probably use my go bar system for this, but honestly the go bar I don't think puts enough pressure on stuff like this, especially on a big flat area. I've said before many times that your, your best gluing technique is to squeeze these things really tightly. The go bar won't do that on a big flat thing like this. Just thought I'd show you something I'm also doing here. I was doing it off camera, but I've, I've toothed this up with a tooth blade. In other words, I just take a blade like this that has teeth on it and I scratch it up a little bit just to make it a little bit rougher. I don't like to make it real rough, you know, just a little bit. And, uh, you know, glass smooth probably doesn't glue quite as well as just having a little bit of surface there. And you can see there how much comes off of there. So this is just acetone. It dries and doesn't leave much residues. I'll give this acetone a few, couple minutes to uh, leach out of there and, and get good and dry before I glue it. It's just time to get her done, you know. I've kind of got a mark here where everything was before, so I'll just kind of go by that. I also put a pencil mark where I, where I want the front of the bridge to end up. You can see by these two holes in the t top here, or maybe you could see those holes, there was two holes, that it at one time had a screwed on type bridge. That had been replaced already apparently. I don't like any kind of fasteners in my bridges at all. I've seen nothing but more problems created from those kinds of connections than I have, uh, you know, good things. It's always been a problem of some sort. It causes your top to crack or something else, you know, it just creates problems. So I only use glue and wood to wood connections on, on bridges and bridge plates and things. I'll do a little bit of measuring just to make sure I'm not way off a of center or anything. I guess in this case um, I'll have to do it like I would do it through the sound hole. So I'll put the adjustments on the outside since there is a bridge on there. Well, there's what she looks like all glued up on the and clamped up on the inside. And that's, of course, what it always looks like on the outside, as you've seen in many videos before. Anyway, that will need to sit for a couple of hours and uh, do its thing. I've removed the little clamps off of these. These are all dry, and uh, I'm pretty sure it's, it's really good everywhere else. The one thing I'm doing, just because I can, I guess, and that is that I'm going around and I'm knocking out all this dried glue that was in here from the factory, and there's a lot of it. And I guess the reason I want to do that is it, it may show up a problem, you know, like as I 
pop this off, there could be a place where the top is loose from the sides or anything like that. So I don't see as it hurts anything. It sure don't help anything to have it in there. And since I've got it open and I'm waiting for this to dry anyway, I might as well get rid of it. Well, I do think I've finally caught up with this uh, Regal guitar. And I do think it's pretty solid. I have not tapped on it yet. I always tap on them before I put them back together because that's where you find out if there's anything else loose because you'll hear a rattle. Sounds perfect. Sounds perfectly solid, so that part's good. I had some loose bindings on here. I glued all those back that I could find, but if there's any more, we'll hear them now, probably. That sounds really good and solid, too. In a perfect world, this would meet up perfectly, and all I'd have to do is clamp it down. I haven't lived in a perfect world in the last 66 years. What I'm really concerned about, to be truthful, is the neck angle. It doesn't matter. Even if this did line up perfectly and I put it back on here perfectly, the neck angle could be wrong. Here's a chance to fix the neck angle before we get this all glued up tight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some clamps around this dry and you know get it as mocked up as close to perfect as I can with the clamps on it and then I'm going to do some very good neck angle testing because once you get the glue on here it's all over. You can't change that neck angle at all then. I have the back attached just dry at the moment, no glue, with these clamps and it's lining up fairly well. Based on that lineup I'm checking the neck angle you know, it's funny because I checked it a minute ago and it seemed perfect. Now it's a little bit low, if anything. Depending on how you think of it, the, it's not clearing the bridge here is what I'm saying. And it was clearing the bridge there just a moment ago. Just barely though. And there it is clearing it again. So that'll show you how delicate this attachment point is. If you don't think attaching the back to your guitar is delicate you are mistaken and you are sadly mistaken because it is very very critical to your neck angle the slightest movement changes your neck angle that's why taking the back off of an instrument is not nearly as easy as it sounds because everybody says just take the back off just take the back off it's a lot easier yeah okay but put the back back on there and see if the neck works still that's where you get a lot of problems. In fact, a lot of the neck angle or neck resets I've had to do over the years have been because the backs have been removed and the guitars put back together and then the neck doesn't work anymore. But this is pretty close right now. You do have to pay very close attention to that. What I think I'm going to do, and I've done it this way in the past, is I'm gonna start at the back, work my way around to these low spots with glue and I'm gonna stop there. That still gives me a little bit of flex here at this end up here to change the neck angle if I need to by pulling down on it and gluing it and clamping it. If I just tried to do the whole thing at once, it's pretty much potluck on whether it's gonna work or not. For you, my friends, mere seconds for me, a whole weekend snuck in there somehow. I'm going to go ahead and get this thing glued up, at least up to the waist, as I mentioned. You want a pretty good amount on here, but you just don't want it so that it's just going to squeeze out everywhere. The most difficult thing about these clamps is when you're tightening down these wing nuts, the whole shaft wants to spin off, and so it's hard to hold that still and get it as tight as it needs to be. There's times when this stuff cooperates, and there's times when it doesn't. And right now it's not cooperating. It seems like anytime you get it, you're in a hurry because of glue. It, seems to always give you trouble. Yeah, it's sliding off of there. The, the 
the edges of this are slick and this leather makes it slide right off so it's hard to get keep the clamp on there where it doesn't slide off and of course anything that can happen will happen because the peg head bumped the little thing of water I had here and knocked water everywhere so those are the kinds of things you actually deal with when you're doing this it's difficult at best to do these things it may look simple and it's not exactly rocket science but yet it ain't it's not all as easy as it may look I'm trying to go to these bigger clamps because the head's bigger it'll won't slide off as easy but they're not quite as long either so they just barely work The finish being on here, you know, just makes it that much slicker, of course. I'm trying to keep the edges and the, top and the back lined up as well as I can while I'm doing this. It really does kind of fight you all the way. Like right now, the waist is moving in here, so... I'm going to have to uh, get it in a position where I can push the side out to clamp this next couple of clamps. Much more difficult to do than it may appear. I'm pushing on the inside here. You can't really see that in the camera, but I got my hand in the sound hole. I'm pushing the side up and I'm tightening this clamp down, you know. The old three hand deal, you know, if you had three hands it'd be easy. That's kind of the way this is. And then on this side it's going to even be more difficult unless I turn it around where I can get my hand through the sound hole. I know you're not really seeing it as well as it can be seen, but it's difficult to take time to move the camera when I'm in a time crunch. If all the edges are lined up, you really won't be able to tell I took this apart. Because I sawed the back off of it, it's uh, a smooth connection there. But it is really difficult to get it to clamp back up where you can't feel it either. It's, it just, you would think it would just line right back up and you could just put the clamps on it no problem, but that isn't really how it works. Everything changes and flexes and Everything's under different tensions. The back has its tension, the sides have its tension, and of course the top has its own tension as well, and, and that affects how the sides act. It just should be easy, it's just not. That's all I can explain to you. So we're just gonna have to give it some time now and let that set. And then we can work on the front end of this and also check the neck angle at the same time. More than likely, if I went ahead and glued it back, it would be back just like it was. But with all the changes and brace supports and things I made, I don't know if the neck angle has changed much or not. And it may have. So it's really better insurance to check the neck angle before you glue the last little bit on. It's only been about an hour since I clamped this all up, but in, in that hour I went out there and changed the blades on my wife's lawn tractor, sharpened up two more sets of blades, and videoed a little bit of that to boot. So you'll probably see that in a shop talk way before you see this. I've been uh, in the last five minutes here checking this to see if it's about right and it is just about right looking when I look down the top the neck down here at the, the base just roughly in the level area of this and uh, so it's it's really pretty good so with that in mind I think I can probably go ahead and get the glue on the rest of this it's always harder to get the glue in it once you glue part of it down obviously doing it by this method is good and bad 
it fixes problems and it creates problems. So you just kind of got to work with it. So I'm putting some wedges in there to hold the gap open. And I'll get the glue in there as best I can. I'm not going to really film all that. I'm just going to squirt glue in there and paint it around. And then I'll show you what it looks like all clamped up. I believe that's going to have to do it. I'm just going to try to check the angle here one more time with all the clamps and everything to see how bad it is. Boy, it's real close. It's, you know, could I say it's perfect? It's hard to say. It really, it's, it's pretty close to what I want. Might have to lower the saddle a little bit and that wouldn't be a terrible thing because that's a pretty darn tall saddle. So, we'll just have to wait until all the glue dries to see whether I'm smiling or crying. Well, my friends, I'm sure for you it's only going to seem like a second. For me, you could probably multiply that by maybe a hundred thousand seconds. It's been a while since I worked on this. I don't even know how many days. It's been several days. Just about ready to do something with it. I got the clamps off of it. I've tapped on it. You can hear it's solid. See, there's no vibration now. Like before, everywhere you tapped on this thing, it was just a rattle, you know. And, you know, the back is glued back on it good. Now, what I'm noticing is th there is some glue squeeze out around the seam here. And, you know, there's a close-up of what the seam looks like. Now, keep in mind, this one was sawn off. In other words, I took a saw and actually sawed it off. Rather than peel the binding off and then peel the back off, you know, all of that trauma. Honestly, it looks as good or better than anything you would do the other way and it was way cheaper for the customer. I've done that before, you understand. This wasn't the first time I've done that, but I may start doing that more often because honestly, it's probably the best way to go. I mean, it really is, because it, it, it kind of creates less damage than any other method. And it just goes back together so much easier. And time is money and looks, you know, I mean, the looks are great, I think. In fact, I don't think I could beat the looks you know, if I did it the other way. The only thing I gotta do now is clean it up and I can, you know, I can feel the squeeze out and stuff. So what I do a lot of times is take a plastic pick. One of our wonderful viewers supplied us with some uh, plastic razor blades. Basically they look like single edge razor blades made out of plastic. And uh, I'll get some of those and go through here and see if I can pop that glue off. The plastic doesn't seem to scratch the finish, yet it pops the glue off fairly well. So that's what I'll try here. So I'm taking one of these little single edge plastic razor blade things and I'm, I'm going along the edge like this and you can see the glue popping right off. I probably ought to get my safety glasses on because it's actually popping up in the air, popping right at my eyes. The only negative of these, I mean like a guitar pick honestly works just about as good. These are a little soft actually and you can maybe see how the edge is getting torn up there. I don't know if you can see it right on this edge. So what I'm doing is I'm just taking this and, and rubbing it on here like that just to clean it up a little bit. It's probably quicker to do that than it is to just change these really, or just as quick. I mean, I got a bunch of these. I could just throw this one away, but no point in wasting anything, I guess. Like I said, it's just about as quick to do that and it only takes a little bit of that to get it back to shape. The cool thing about this is it really doesn't scratch the guitar at all. Most of the places I had already washed the glue off, you know, even in those places there's a little film and this seems to be knocking the film off even. Now here's a spot where the glue is kind of thick, honestly. I think I'll just take a regular razor blade and go real slow right here. I know you can't really see what I'm doing, but it's pretty thick right here. So I'm just gonna get under it and kind of pop it up. That seems to have worked. Well, you get the idea. I think I've got it pretty well cleaned up. I'm going to go around it a little bit, maybe do a little bit of light sanding. I'm not going to film all that, but I'm just going to do a little more cleanup around there. 
And then I think we're ready to start trying to string this thing up and see where it's at. The customer felt like it was going to need a neck reset. You know, I tried really hard to get the neck right as I glued this back back on there. So I think it's going to be okay. You don't know till you know. Well, as you can probably see, I've got the two E strings on the guitar. I wanted to check uh, several things, action and uh, intonation and different things and see where we're at. This is a little bit high. We're about 120, two or three thousandths on this E string. So we can take that down fairly easily. There's the, the saddle is fairly high. On this side, it looks pretty good actually. It's about 90 on this side. So we're really not bad here. It could go down a few thousands, wouldn't hurt nothing. But it looks like we're in a buzz situation on the, on the nut. Up here, it's, it, the nut's cut a little low. The nut's not actually on the end of the fretboard either. There's a, you probably can't see that very good, but there's a gap between the nut and the fretboard. And there's a fairly sizable gap actually. In fact, this probably stand in there. Yep, see you can see that it's standing up in that gap. So that's not good either. And I may do a real quick light dressing on the frets. And now that I know how high this is, I'll take the saddle down a little bit. So that way I can do it all kind of in one removal of the strings. Because these strings go through the bridge, they're not easy to remove here. So I have to loosen it all up up here and just kind of get them out of my way is really what it boils down to. That's why I only put the two strings on it because I just don't want to have to deal with a whole bunch of stuff here during this initial setup. But I do think I can work with it just like it is. I don't think it's going to need a neck reset. I'm not sure if it's going to need a new nut. Once I get this nut straightened up, it might be tall enough. I don't know, but we're going to work on all that here in just a moment. I've got the strings loosened up and this nut is somewhat loose. It's, I can push it forwards and backwards. I'm going to see if I can just lift it out of here with my hands. It's been loose a long time. You can see the dirt and junk that's gotten down in there. So I'm going to clean this slot up. You know, there's a chance I'm, what I may do on this guitar, again, because there's no point in reinventing the whole wheel here. I could easily put a little thin shim under this saddle and make it work. And that might be the smart thing to do on this guitar in this case. I think it might very well be the, the wise thing to do. And you really wouldn't hardly see it anyway, and I think we can stain it to match, so I think it's probably the best option. Rather than spend an hour and a half, charge the guy, you know, 150 bucks to make a new nut. Because this one seems to be very close in terms of working. So I'm going to clean this all up here. I'm going to do that off camera. Just going to scrape it out, clean it up, clean this up, and then we'll glue it back in place here, possibly with a shim under it. Well, my friends, I cleaned out all the creep and crud between the nut and the end of the fingerboard, and there was quite a bit. I mean, honestly, there was a lot of junk there. Now that I've got the nut fitting up tight to the end of the fingerboard there, just want hoping against hope that there might be enough clearance. Looks like it's still going to need a little bit. But on the other hand, I haven't done a fret leveling yet, and I can level these frets a little bit and maybe even lean a little bit toward this first fret. It may even be high, in fact. If I was guessing, I'd say it actually was because this one looks lower cut to the fingerboard. I just use my typical fret leveling file. This is a homemade file that I made. This is just a uh, six inch mill bastard file, Nicholson, made in USA. I just put a little wooden block on it, a little piece of maple, uh, something that just kind of fits my hand good, you know, my thumb and, and whatever, make it kind of ergonomic. Rounded it off back here to fit back in the palm of my hand. But the, the key thing about this, more so than all of that, is that there is no such thing as a flat file. In fact, I've had people argue with me 
oh, those files are flat, you, you know, and they'll just argue with you. And I said, no, they're really not flat. If you look at a file brand new out of a package and you look at it really close with a very detailed eye, one side will be concave and one side will be convex. You want the concave side, the hollow side up, the rounded side, the convex side down in contact with your frets. Now, we are only talking a mere couple of thousandths of an inch, you know, so you have to look really close to see it, but that's the way you want this to work if you want to do a good job with your fret leveling. So when you glue this onto your board, be sure you do that. The other thing is uh, then I take and grind off just the rounded front nose of this so that it doesn't catch on the frets and I round off the back of course so it doesn't catch on the frets. Then you can just slide it back and forth just like this and you can actually if you start to develop your feel you can feel the high fret. I mean you can seriously feel it and I do feel it grabbing on this first fret and if you look here there's nothing being cut off of this one you probably can't see that because I don't have it zoomed in, but it's cutting off of this one here, it's cutting off of here, but it's not cutting off of this fret. So that indicates to me that this fret is high. So we'll work on that. Honestly, that may solve our problem with the buzzing right there off the nut. Some people get all hung up about how perfectly level it has to be. It does need to be very level. That's, there's no doubt about that. But the point of it is, is you can flare it back. In other words, I can take more off of here and then flare it back very slightly to the end. And uh, as long that way, as long as the as long as you don't feel this thing grabbing on a high fret, you're good. Like I can feel it grabbing right here. I can feel it grabbing a little bit here and definitely here. So I mean, you can actually feel that it, with the file if you're paying attention. It's not very hard to feel either. It's it's fairly obvious. So anyway, that's the that's how I do it. That's how I use a fret file. I'm going to go ahead and do this off camera, but I just wanted to show you what I'm doing. I've spent a little bit of time, only, you know, maybe a minute or so leveling these. It doesn't take very long. One thing I thought about t talking about is, you know, this is a radius fingerboard, which most all guitar necks are radius. You'll find them flat on classical guitars a lot of times, but on most steel string guitars, the, the neck does have a slight radius to it. So you obviously have to keep that in mind and you keep this thing moving up and down as you're going, like this. See, you don't just stay in one spot. You have to feather it this way and feather it this way, just so you understand. I think I've got this one up in pretty good shape now. It really doesn't take all that much filing on a uh, relatively flat board. Some of them take a lot of filing, of course, but this one's not that bad. I always clean it off like this first. Just take a paintbrush and clean it off. And now I need to recrown them all, and I'll use the recrowning file. I used to always use the recrowning file that fit the fret. I have learned that it recrowns much faster and looks better, in my opinion, if you use the large recrowning file. Now the problem with that is these edges stick down too far, so I took it over to the belt sander and laid it on there and actually kind of rocked it so that the edges got knocked off. I didn't knock off the center, as you can see but I knocked off the edges up to the center. That way I can go down on lower, smaller frets, but it recrowns them much faster. I gotta be honest, this is the new one from Stumac and it doesn't hold it like the old one did. I tighten it up all the time and it just doesn't seem to hold it as well. If you notice, I did actually slip and scratch that there. I'm not going to try to hide it. It's very minimal scratch. But 
The reason I don't care about that right now is look at this fingerboard up close. Look at how that's a factory finish and look at all the scratches in it. And I can tell you that's from the factory. If not, it's just was from somebody who really did some sloppy work. So I've got to scratch all that out of there anyway. I'm not worried about that little minor scratch I just put in there. In fact, it's very minor compared to the rest of it. If your ends are sharp, you can also take this and work it at a 45 and it will and, and work it around and it will get rid of those sharp ends too. The few frets that got extra filing, it takes a little more to get their crown up to the peak there, but like this one here is pretty low. Because this fretboard is so scarred up, it's even, and it does have some finger grooves in it too that we got to take out. You know, I'm not worried about this one at all. And because of that, I'm going to take some 400 sandpaper and sand it lengthwise like this. And the reason I'm doing that is because it does, it, it gets these frets really slick much, much faster than any other method. And you'd be surprised how it rounds them off, too. It really makes them nice. And like I said, the fretboard has to be reworked anyway, so it doesn't hurt the fretboard at all, even though you can see it's turning the fretboard kind of gray. That'll all go away here in just a moment. This is by far the fastest way to get these frets really looking shiny and clean. In fact, this makes them almost mirror shiny, doing it this way. Now that I've got all those frets sanded smooth, I just want to uh, say this because I know I'm going to get some comments. People are going to say, you're going to leave scratches in your frets this way. Well, first of all, if you look at this 400 grit, it's pretty doggone fine. There's no sandpaper. You can't even feel the grit with your fingers. Second of all, when you're sanding metal, it's even finer. And third, when you're doing this, you're moving it back and forth so that the line, there is no such thing as a line in line. It all gets buffed out. You can take your fingernail and rub it on here and you cannot feel it anywhere. I imagine I could take the edge of this razor blade, rub it across there, you can't feel it. It's just as slick as snot on a doorknob. So there is no lines going this way. So you're wasting your time making that comment to me. I've been doing it this way for nearly 40 years. So take a close up look at that and see how round, round and shiny they are. They're really nice. It does a really nice job. I can still go over these with the semi-chrome and make them even more mirror-like. I'm not sure this really warrants that, but I may do that. Right now though, I'm going to uh, definitely work on the spaces between the frets because this fingerboard is really chowdered up. That one's almost gone, not quite gone. Uh-oh, here's a little loose piece of binding right here, too, I just noticed. So I need to get that glued back. Okay, I'm only going to show you these first two frets. Look at the first two frets compared to the rest of them there, and you can see the, the difference, I think. Now, keep in mind, these still do have those finger grooves in it. You know, I don't know if I want to take it all the way out or not, but I, I want to get it down pretty close. But the rest of this has to be done this way and cleaned up. And then I may just oil it. it. You know, it doesn't look like it's going to look bad this way. I thought it was going to turn real light colored, but it doesn't look real light. It may be okay the way it is without staining it. Staining it would just take a lot more time and, and clean up and all that because you'd have to clean up the binding. So if I can just oil it, the oil will make it a little darker. I think that'll look fine. There is a mother of pearl dot and you can go right over those dots too if you're holding your razor blade really tight. And then the last thing I wanted to show you before I turn the camera back off and finish this up is that after I do all that then I take 
the, the corner of the razor blade and run it right along every fret on both sides. But, uh, anyway, that gets rid of all the fuzzies right up against there, makes it a nice neat job, then I'll oil it. I'll show you when I get to the oiling process what it looks like. One more little tip that I just thought of is whenever you have lines that are going perpendicular to your fingerboard and you're scraping it this way, well your razor blade likes to catch down into those grooves. So that makes it hard to get those lines out of there. So what you have to do is you cant your razor blade slightly. In other words, I'm, I'm showing you here and I'm exaggerating it. You don't cant it that much, but you do cant it slightly so that you're not in line with those grooves. If you're in line with the grooves, you're just gonna bump and keep bumping over the top of them. If you cant it slightly, you won't be in line with them and you can cut them all down smooth. So that's a real good tip on how to use your razor blade. This little piece of binding needs to be glued back on before it breaks off entirely. I've got my canopy glue here. I've already scraped the binding and the area to get it clean. So I'm just going to spread the glue here, just using this X-Acto knife to get it spread in there behind the plastic. I already have uh, the fingerboard all planed off with the razor blade. I haven't cleaned it up yet, but I thought I better get this glued before this ends up breaking off of here. So I'm going to wrap this with something. I'm not sure exactly what yet. I might just use tape, I guess. That might be the easiest. I was thinking about wrapping it all the way around, but I think the tape will hold it just fine. That will allow me to go ahead and clean up the fingerboard a little bit more. I want to clean up all of these frets like this with, and get rid of all the fuzzies right up against the frets. So I'm gonna do that. Again, I'll do that off camera as well. A little emblem right here and she goes, that's Jerry's. And I said, yeah, that's Jerry's. And she said, I love Jerry. Oh, I was like, oh. I said, you do? I said, I know. I said, we love Jerry. I said, he's awesome. That's and, pretty uh, sweet. She's got one of her little tuning keys is loose on her guitar. Uh -huh. And uh, I told her, I said, you want me to take your guitar to, to Jerry's to fix that key? She goes, no, no. She said, let me fix it. I, I fix it. So she wants to try to fix it. But if she doesn't fix it, then... <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, it's that's cool. sweet of her. Yeah. It was just so cute. Just, just out of the blue, you know. I'm fishing oh, here. My grandson said something almost that sweet, except it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> A little jerk. He's seven years old. You know, Trini, the really smart one. Yeah. He's, I was showing him his that glary guitar, you know, that I was giving to him. And I was playing a little bit on it. And, you know, I can't play a guitar with a darn. And so I made a couple mistakes. I said, oh, whoops, I made a mistake. And then I showed him again. And I said, oh, sorry, I screwed it up again. He goes, don't worry, Grandpa, you were only buffering. <laughs> Just like, like a computer buffers. <laughs> He's seven years old. I'm going, like, give me a break, you little brat. <laughs> seven years old says that. That is awesome. You need to say that in a shop. I, I, I probably yeah. will, because that, that's, that's just that's, nuts. That should be your title right there. Yeah. Shop talk. I'm, I'm only buffering. I have cut the saddle down, so it ought to be just about perfect now. Um, I've got to get give this some time to set up on this binding so I can't really go ahead and go any further at the moment. I went ahead and oiled this as I think you saw and uh, I haven't oiled the first fret yet because of the tape but so we're getting we're making progress we got a little time here to uh, wait before we can finish it up. So I made myself a shim for going underneath this uh, nut and I made it out of ebony and uh, it's only 16 thousandths of an inch thick. <laughs> it's pretty darn thin. So now I can uh, put this in here and I think this is gonna be perfectly sufficient. Nobody's gonna really see it anyway. 
and uh, just going to save a lot of time and effort and I can it'll just take a second to cut it down so I'll cut that down and lay it in there thought you might like to see how I'm going to uh, cut this down or at least I'm going to attempt to cut it down and that is with a pair of scissors I mean it's just a piece of thick paper that's really about all it boils down to that should give us just the right amount of height that we needed because we were basically touching here and sixteen thousandths should just give us about sixteen thousandths clearance maybe a little more probably because of the glue etc but it should be pretty close we will probably have to cut it just a tiny bit the groove I mean I'll just use the super fatic glue this glue is the most uncooperative glue on camera I've ever seen I don't think it's ever worked on camera without having to open it up the reason I'm clamping this one I don't normally clamp these but this one here keeps kind of pulling away from the end of the fingerboard so I'm just trying to keep it in place as it sets up. I think that'll do it. It looks real good and tight there so I'm just going to go ahead and let that set for an hour or so. I skipped ahead on the Regal Rec 2. I've got the strings on here, got them up to pitch. I haven't check the actual action yet it probably is a little bit high but maybe not too much I did reduce the the uh, saddle on the base side specifically but with the nut jacked up a little bit there with that uh, tiny shim I put in there it all needs to be looked at a little bit more on this E string than we need so let's take that down just a hair One thing I've noticed on this is that these nut, the slots are not consistent. You know, I've said before many times you want to keep a very consistent angle. You know, and you basically want it to mirror pretty much your peg head. Just kind of be even with your peg head like that. And these are anything but even. I'm cutting the front, you know, the front end of this off and the back end here, I'm almost leaving where it's at. Mostly because these are really filed very flat. And the problem with flat is they'll buzz inside of the nut. I don't think I actually lowered that any yet. Um, that was really not cut very well. Let's see here, it's, it's still quite high. It takes many iterations of this sometimes to get it just right. You don't want to go past it because once you pass it, you're you got to make a new nut and then you got trouble. That's getting pretty close. Let's check it back here at the 12th fret just to see where it's at. See if it's still real high. Even after I lowered it down a lot, it's still pretty high. It's still about 110 thousandths here, so we, we could go down another 20 thousandths back here at the saddle easily. We might, might have to go more than that. Take off just a little tiny bit more here. Hopefully I can get it just right. While I've got it out of there, I'll go ahead and fill this one with uh, pencil lead. This is such a slick plastic that it really doesn't need much. That's just perfect right there. Just perfect. And now let's just see where this is at on the final try here. Still very close to 120 thousandths. So it still could go down quite a bit. 120 down to 90, that's 
30 thousandths and so that means 60 more thousandths need to come off of here. Let's see where the treble side is. I think the treble side is pretty close. Well, it's up a little bit now. Let me look at the underbow in the neck now. There doesn't seem to be very much underbow, but there could be a tiny bit. I guess I'll go ahead and file the nut on all of the rest of these. I'll do that off camera and get the nut pretty close. Then I'll check it one more time and then I'll cut this saddle down one more time and we should be good. Off camera there, I finished up the nut and uh, I checked the action here. It's about 20 thousandths high all the way across. So that means I need to take 40 thousandths off the bridge or off the saddle, I should say. And I've loosened the strings up a lot and I'm hoping I can get this saddle out of here without having to take it all apart. I think I can, but it's, it's gonna be a, a little tight squeeze. But ask me if I've ever done this before. Sure I have, so I think I can make it work. There we go. That got it out of there. I gotta mark 40 thousandths all the way across this thing and take it over to the sander. In case you don't remember how I do that, put a little black mark on each edge like that. You set your calipers at the desired depth. That's 40 and a half thousandths. That'll probably be close enough. If you can see a half a thousandths, you're doing better than me. Scratch that across there. Now all you do is you slide that into your sander till both lines just touch the sander. Very easy to do actually. That's the most accurate, easy way to, to move it. Well, there you have it my friends. I believe I've got this thing finished. So the Regal Rec 2 has met its match. I still need to oil this first fret. I didn't do that, which would have been smart if I'd have done that beforehand. I was going to test the truss rod also, just to make sure that it is tight. I, I can see the very faintest hint of a relief in this area, and that's okay. Uh, a hint of relief is what you kind of want, but I am going to, since I do need to oil this first fret, I'm gonna do this off camera, but I'm gonna take, take the strings loose one more time, take this truss rod cover off, make sure the truss rod is snugged up as tight as it can be snugged up, I guess you'd say. I don't, and when I say that, I don't mean like as tight as it can go. I'm talking about like you wanna make sure it ain't loose. You wanna snug it up so that it's like it's not gonna just vibrate loose or something like that. And if I don't find anything unusual there, I'm not gonna show it to you. But if I do find something unusual, I will show you as always. Okay, so I was, I'm glad I took this truss rod cover off. The uh, nut is totally loose. I can spin it with my fingers. You probably can't see that, but I, can, yeah, I can't get my finger in there and do it, but I can spin it with my finger, trust me. It's really loose. So that's never a good thing. You know, righty tighty, in other words, if you're looking at the end of the truss rod, you turn it to your right. In other words, over the top to the right. And um, all right, I'm just snugging it up. And see, I'm just doing it with two fingers here, okay? That's about as tight as I can get it with a couple of fingers. And that's about as tight as it probably needs to be. That's pretty tight. It's, you know, I, I gotta, I guess I should say that I do feel like my fingers are pretty strong. So, you know, I've gotten it pretty tight for two fingers. Snug, but not crazy tight so that you're gonna break something. So it's snugged up. It's still got room to tighten it up some more if, if it turned out to have a bigger underbow. I've always said, if you can see a relief in your neck, generally you have too much. You know, 10 thousandths relief is pretty tiny. It's the thickness of a human hair. No, I'm sorry, it's the, twice the thickness of a human hair. So it's pretty tiny. And you know, to see that down the length there, if you can see that, you're, you've got really good eyes. I can see that, believe it or not, but uh, I've been looking at this stuff for a very long time. So when I saw this one and I saw the, the relief, I thought, yeah, it's probably got a little bit more than it needs because I can see it fairly well. So anyway, we tightened that back up. We'll put the truss rod 
cover back on it. And some people might say, well then how did I level the frets if I didn't have that tight? Again, we're talking the thickness of a human hair or just a little bit more than that. And over the length of that, that fret file doesn't care. It's just not that terribly important. The only time it really is important that you have the truss rod really tight is, or, or tightened up at least, is when there is a significant underbow. And that's a totally different ball game, a totally different animal you're dealing with. When you can look down at it and see a really big underbow, then you got bigger problems and you need to start working on that. That's not what we have here. This was just a very, very, very minor underbow. And I'm going to put pencil lead down in here. Actually, believe it or not, the mechanical pencil transfers to this much better. I don't know why, but it does. I've always thought the, the uh, mechanical pencil lead was actually harder, but it seems to transfer to this plastic much better. The slots are getting too small even for that, so here's the fine leaded pencil. We'll go in there with that. Well, the Regal Rec seems to be working out real good. I really should call it Regal Rec 2, but uh, I think we're in good shape. I can see where someone has tried to re-glue this pick guard once. I'm going to scrape all of that old glue off and see if we can't make it work again. And I honestly can't guarantee it, but I think it'll work. This is the old plastic you can tell that's really flammable. You can smell it. It's super, super, super flammable. If you touch a match to that, it'll just poof, go up like, a, like that and be gone. It wouldn't hurt to wipe it down with something. I'm gonna, I decided to just play it safe because of the old type plastic and just use some denatured alcohol. I'm pretty sure that won't create any problem. And there is a little bit of creeping crud coming off of it, so it's probably a good thing to wipe it down a little bit. So I'm wiping it really good with that clean towel too. The reason is I'm going to try the two-way tape to stick it down with that, and I want it as clean as I can possibly get it. Line it up with the old shadow. I think I'll get my close-up specs on for that. Light over here a little bit better. I think that worked pretty good. I think we covered the old shadow really well. Now the last little thing is where someone else had replaced this bridge, they've left quite a bit of damage here. I'm going to just try touching that up and making it look a little bit better and see what we can do about that. Because these marks are pretty much down to, you know, to bare wood, I'm going to try this amber shellac. It often matches these old finishes really well. It virtually makes some of these just disappear. I mean, they just go away. I'm not sure how many of these you can see. And I'll probably end up knocking my varnish over and everything here trying to show you this. But like there's little white specks here. And if you get just a tiny bit of the varnish on there, it makes most of them go away, especially the ones that are through the finish. If they're not through, then it doesn't make them go away too much. Here's a pretty deep hole right here. And I'm just actually just going to see if I can more or less fill that in. That's a pretty deep hole. The shellac is a pretty good filler. The only thing I've got against shellac is it will turn milky white if you sweat on it. So I typically don't use it for a finish. But on touch up like this, it's not too bad. 
I think it made it look better. Anything you can do to improve it where your eye just doesn't get drawn to a, a spot, and I think that helped that a lot. These spots around here on the sides, I don't think this is going to do anything, but it won't hurt to test it, I guess. Doesn't really look like it's going to do much there. I don't know what caused those colors. If I can come up with anything that makes that look better, I'll show you. I don't know if it'll help or not, but I'm going to try a little bit of the Be Good Oil on this to see if it'll, you know, rejuvenate it a little bit. It's it's. It's almost like the finish is dried out and gotten messed up, but yeah, that doesn't look like that's going to do much either, unfortunately. The finish is pretty much flaked off in these places. I'm not sure what that was. I would say it was a strap, a reaction to a strap that was in there, or just a reaction to something, some material in the case. And it's probably some chemical reaction between whatever that chemical was in that other material and the finish. Doesn't really seem like it's going to help it much, so I'm going to call that good enough. It's a, a huge, huge, huge improvement over the way it came in because I really would have called it a wreck or a uh, dumpster diver guitar because it really was on the edge of a dumpster. Um, but it's pretty darn sound now. So let's play it for you and see what it sounds like. Well, my good friends, I believe this Regal Wreck 2 has met its match and it's up in pretty darn good shape. In fact, the action on it is just nice. It's really nice. It's probably never been that nice. It, it plays like a dream. It really does. It's easy, easy, easy to chord. Got a nice sound. Here's a little song, and so you can hear kind of what it sounds like. We live in two different worlds, dear. That's why we're so far apart. You made a world out of vows that were broken, and I built the world in my heart. Yes, everyone here tried to warn me. now. It's back on the road again, as Willie would say. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Please support us by clicking that thumbs up. It does help a lot. And if you're not yet subscribed, please subscribe to the channel. We're trying to get to that 100,000 mark and we're going to make it. Thanks for watching.